I'm going to start with a prediction, and I'm right. And my prediction is that as these new technologies develop, they'll start to drive crime. Um, I wonder how many of you have got a, an Alexa at home, and they're huge fun. Um, this is an, uh, an Amazon Echo, which the, the police were trying to subpoena because it had been a witness in a murder in the United States. And of course, that raises all sorts of issues about whether they're allowed to know what the the secrets that uh, Amazons and the like of, 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 of Amazon, sorry, the, the uh, Echo and the like of Alexa has swallowed. So that's an ongoing debate. Um, the other thing is, of course, that the world is changing enormously quickly and the technology is developing in, in all directions. And the heading on this slide is that there's a growth in the opportunities for crime. And it's those growing opportunities that I am suggesting and predicting will drive the crime rate and I want to point I want to stress that opportunities are incredibly important in crime and I'm going to digress slightly to give you some data on just that this is the crime rate toward the end of the last century up to 19, uh, 2004 actually from from the end of the first world war per thousand population and you can see it's grown enormously in the last half century basically the question is, what could we do about it? By the time we got to 2004, and I was working in the Home Office at the time, the government was starting to freak out about the whole thing. And, oh, my God, look at this. What are we going to do? We need to catch more people. Actually, they didn't. They didn't because there are two kinds of offender. The, the opportunistic offenders, who are easily deterred, but there's lots of them, and the what you might call proper or professional offenders who were once opportunistic and they learnt they got away with things. They're not at all easily deterred and they're the ones we've got to catch. And it's the opportunities to commit crime and the, the, the ubiquitousness of those opportunities that causes the kind of crimes, the rate that we saw on that previous slide. So if I ask the men in this room to put their hands up if they'd ever been arrested for a you know, charge with an indictable offence. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly because I'm suspecting that you, the men in this room are not representative of the general population. You might be a little bit different, but if you were the general population, about 30% of you would put your hands up. So about 30-odd percent of adult males in this country have got a criminal conviction by the age of about 40-something. The figure for women is 8%, and that's because women are nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Those opportunities are what you need to control. And this next slide is data from the Crime Survey for England and Wales. From the first year it was, um, it was uh, launched in 1981 to 2017, to the end of last year. And you can see from the 1990s, mid-90s, the drop. That data is more reliable than the slide I showed you earlier, which is police-recorded crime, which is notoriously bad because the public don't report everything to the police. This is going straight to the public and asking them. And that drop in crime, although people will argue about it and some academics will argue till the cows come home, but I promise you it is to do with the fact that we brought opportunities under control. From the early 1990s, for example, we had deadlocks and immobilizers on all vehicles at the point of manufacture. And as a consequence, car crime dropped by 70%. And that, in the 1980s, was 25% of all crime. Those two little figures at the very end, they're cyber crime cyber fraud and that's only just started to be measured it was measured for the first time in 2016 and as you can see it's more or less doubled the crimes and we didn't know and the police data are incredibly bad at telling us because people don't know what to do they don't know who to report it to and if they've lost money they'll tell the banks but they won't necessarily tell the police we use the observations and arguments that I've just mentioned to you to persuade the, the Doors trustees to invest in the Doors Centre for Future Crime at UCL. 
and the director of that centre is in the audience here tonight, Professor Shane Johnson. Um, one of the arguments we put was that crimes of the future are an emergent property of the advance of civilization. And on the optimistic assumption that civilization is going to continue to advance, which may not be the case, but let's hope, we will have more crime, and that crime will be driven by those new, new technologies that are being developed. So the first project we decided to do was to have a look at just how many technologies we were talking about and could we pinpoint the best ones or the most likely ones to be involved in future crime. We did an electronic search across the whole of UCL. We searched top science publications, research council um, websites, news outlets and so on, and we talked to some of the researchers involved. And we were slightly alarmed to find that there wasn't one area that we looked at that you couldn't have found a potential crime link. So one of the things, for example, and this is some of the um, output from the first project we did, the first thing to bear in mind is, a, is the context, the background changes that we're going to be seeing over the next 20, 30, 50 years. And the, the ones at the top of the list are kind of scary ones, like climate change and so on. As you get down to the bottom with smart cities, they're the kind of probably quite nice ones. We also found that there are some generic technologies, AI, for example, hyperconnectivity with the Internet of Things, and they've led to some applications, drones, um, autonomous vehicles, smart, all sorts of smart stuff. All of those are, are leading to potential crime problems. They're potentially exploitable. And the game is really to get ahead of that game and try and build the security into the products before they take off, literally in the case of drones. And I think we've kind of missed the boat. Um, and it's very difficult to design these things so that they don't necessarily cause a crime wave. One of the other observations we had, and this slide's a bit, a bit um, complicated, but basically what it's showing is that um, the, the little blue dots are the departments in UCL, and you can see computer science with 97 scientists there working on security-related matters. Each of the, those blue blobs are departments, and the little green blobs are the people. So almost a vast number of the departments across UCL, people were working on security-related things, but they weren't necessarily talking to each other. And this next slide is slightly differently formatted. In this case, the green dots are the departments and the blue dots are the people. But you, sorry, the, the, the green dots are the, um, the topics. You get more of a sense of the potential for working together, but it still isn't particularly prevalent, and I want to come back to this point later. We also decided to try and take a guess on which of these technologies were going to be <clears throat> the most sensitive to crime problems. And this list on the, on the topic side, the shading reflects the extent to which the problems are going to be the more immediate, if you like. So we were really interested in looking at the way crime, place, and the internet are related to each other. We know in the real world, as it were, that crime clusters. We know that we get repeat victims. We know that we get near repeats, so that people who live next door to each other are more likely to be burgled than they otherwise would be. Those sorts of observations apply to the real world, but when you take it into the virtual world, our question was to what extent do the same sorts of things occur? I'm not going to go down the list. Um, the, ones, the little topics that are asterisks are areas on which we're working. What I want to finish with is something about the implications. And the first one, and that bird incidentally is, is guarding, is preventing himself from getting bird flu. Um, <laughs> and I, I meant the point because it's about prevention and we've got to think differently about crime. The way to control crime is not just about catching offenders, it is about thinking differently and thinking about prevention. We've got to adopt the polluter pays principle. 
So that if, um, well, let me not be too provocative, if um, Facebook, for example, are making millions and millions of dollars out of their systems, and they're causing a crime wave, then on the principle that the polluter pays, they are responsible for doing something about it. We should worry about measurement. I've talked about police crime data and the crime survey. We haven't a clue what emerging problems we're going to be facing. Um, I've illustrated with cybercrime, we only started measuring it in 2016, and it's through the roof. And we need to get better at seeing what's coming. The threats are widespread, the technologies are developing at a massive rate, and the offenders are going to be picking them up very soon. And there are enormous silos in academic life, and we need to start breaking those down as well. And my last point is I think we need to think strategically over a much longer term. I worked in government and I can tell you that democracy does not lend itself to strategic thinking. Thank you. Mark, I believe it's your turn. understand me, uh, despite the Scottish accent. Um, so, as uh, I was introduced, uh, I hold the Chair of Statistics at Imperial College London. Um, and the, the question that was posed uh, for this event was, could an artificial intelligence predict a crime before it happens? And so I took the lead on uh, trying to answer this question. But I think before we can answer that question, we need to be clear on what an artificial intelligence actually happens to be at this present time. And the, the, the first point to make is that as far as artificial intelligence research is concerned, uh, it's really nowhere near anything that we would uh, recognize as either human intelligence or intelligence of a chimpanzee or what have you. Um, there is an awful lot of excitement uh, which is now transforming into hype within the, uh, the news agencies and, and uh, uh, television broadcasts uh, about very dire warnings as to what is going to happen uh, as AI uh, starts to take over us. Uh, and this presents an awful lot of confusion and is extremely alarming. And so I hope that my first bullet point, for those of you that are alarmed, um, will give you a good reason to have a good night's sleep this evening, that um, we're not going to be taken over by uh, malign artificial intelligences anytime soon. So let's stick with what we do know. Um, so what, what's actually under the hood of an awful lot of the extremely successful, extremely exciting AI technologies that uh, are around us today? Probably one of the, the, the greatest achievements of, of recent years uh, was posted by uh, Google DeepMind uh, with their AlphaGo uh, system, which, which which beat the, the world champion uh, Go players. And it really was a, an absolutely stunning landmark event. But if we look under the hood to see exactly what was going on there, um, here are some of the techniques that were being used uh, within AlphaGo uh, to beat these human Go playing champions. I'm not going to go into the details of what they are, but Monte Carlo Tree Search was one of the technologies that was absolutely essential for AlphaGo to work and to work incredibly well. Global optimization methods, nonlinear function approximation or deep learning as it's, um, as, as it's known, pattern recognition, statistical pattern recognition, dynamic programming, feature engineering, Bayesian statistics, high-performance graphical processing unit computing, and an awful lot of very clever and effective systems engineering 
and integration. And so rather than referring to that as AI or an artificial intelligence, I prefer for the discussion this evening to call it for what it is. It is clever engineering exploiting applied mathematics, mathematical and computational statistical sciences such as machine learning and so forth, um, and computing science and very clever engineering. So with that, um, that's what AI, as I would consider it to be. Um, is it going to be able to help us to forecast the emergence of new types of crimes? Um, or to provide insights to um, law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, uh, as to what is going to be happening. And so there is a research program, uh, quite an extensive one, that is running at the moment, funded by uh, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Councils, um, which, like all of these programs, has to have a, a, an acronym, uh, iconic uh, inference, computation and numerics, providing insights into cities. And this is a five-year program of research, and it's studying activity in cities. And of course, one of the activities that occurs in cities is criminal activity, but we are not uh, just focusing on that. But for this evening, uh, I'll, 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 I'll look at that. And it's brought together a world-leading team of mathematicians, numerical analysts, computer scientists uh, from the likes of Oxford, Manchester, Imperial, uh, and Strathclyde universities. And the whole focus is to develop mathematical, statistical, and computational approaches to future crime. This program is partnering with a number of the police forces in the UK. Uh, we will be seconding from the Alan Turing Institute, one of our researchers, to the commissioner's office uh, at, at the Metropolitan Police. But we're also working, as you can tell from my accent, with Police Scotland uh, and the West Midlands Police. And what we're trying to do is provide insights into the activities uh, in urban development and evolution. So the evolution of crime, for example, criminal activity. Uh, and doing this, as Oliver mentioned, in a statistical or in a data-driven way. And what we are trying to do is answer what-if questions, pose what-if scenarios um, about urban activity. So what was to happen if uh, some of the opportunities for crime uh, in an urban uh, setting uh, were actually enhanced. Could we run time forward and look at a number of plausible scenarios as to what would happen? Or if the um, various government departments were to decide that they were going to be proactive and, and make the opportunities for crime in certain areas uh, be reduced, then could we, again, roll forward in time and look at plausible evolutions until we reach some sort of steady state to understand what the implications would be with regard to uh, enactment of a particular policy, uh, either by government or by uh, the, 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 the police? And so th that's exactly what we're trying to do with criminal activity. The what, the where and the when scenarios. And so we've just recently published a paper with Sir Alan Wilson uh, at, at UCL, um, unashamedly uh, just looking at mathematical ways of trying to gain insights into urban structure and its evolution. So what we want to do is we want to look forward in time and look at plausible scenarios so that we could go to the commissioner's office and say, here are some insights that you may want to look at. Look at these plausible scenarios that may actually uh, evolve over time, given a, a particular stimulus um, because of some uh, policy and so forth. And so 
This is the only equation that's here tonight, and I put it up because I noticed that there are some mathematicians in the audience, and they should be um, feeling nice that there's a stochastic differential equation here. But the key point is that this equation, for some of us, is actually interpretable. And for criminologists, it allows them to take criminological theories and come along to mathematicians and statisticians and embed those theories into a description of the evolution of a complex system as we would see in an urban environment. And so that's what this exactly does. It allows us to look at the forward evolution of some urban configuration within a city, uh, such as London, um, and uh, start to look at how things may well evolve. So it allows us to encapsulate socioeconomic and criminological theories in a formal mathematical manner, which we can interpret very clearly. Here's an example of the retail system in London. The large red dots indicate the amount of retail floor space there is. And so you'll immediately recognize Oxford Street um, and so forth. And some of you will probably recognize some of the, the larger shopping units uh, out in the, the areas that, that you may well live in. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take that differential equation and we're going to embed some socioeconomic theory into it. And what we're going to then do is play forward in time what will happen if the Lord Mayor's office makes it easier for people to get into the centre of the city, okay? Either by the miracle of some advanced transportation, inexpensive uh, public transportation, whatever. And what I'm showing you here are four realizations. This is one plausible scenario, right? After the Lord's Mayor office, Lord Mayor's office has made it difficult for people to actually commute into the city centre. And so what you see is that retail activity actually develops more uniformly and in the outlying areas where people live. And so these are four random realizations of the future evolution after tariffs have been um, imposed on people moving into the city. Now, what happens if the, Lord's, the, the, the mayor's office made it easier and um, to, to actually move into the city and then you know, do, go some, do, do some shopping? Well, now we start to see scenarios evolving where the activity starts to concentrate in the center. And if we make it so easy, in fact, and so attractive for people to move uh, and, and to commute into the city, then you see this concentration uh, exactly where we would expect it to be. Now, this is nothing but differential equations. There's no artificial intelligence. There is data. Um, and we are obtaining insights into the implications of enacting policies, um, in this case, for retail activity. Here now is burglary. And what you're seeing is a time series of how burglary actually would develop uh, within the London metropolitan area. And unsurprisingly, what we see is a concentration in the centre and in certain areas where most people live. If I look at theft from the person, you'll see much the same. Now, some of you might notice, if you stare long enough, a little yellow dot indicating a very high level of activity of theft. There it is. Okay, so this happens at a certain point in time. And of course, for those of you that know London, you'll know that this is Wembley, Wembley Arena, big uh, 
event happening, lots of people uh, where theft can actually take place from the person. We can go further and build statistical maps of where certain types of crime may well occur where, and when they may well occur and where, where and when these types of crime may actually shift depending on uh, certain um, enactments such as police, you know, an enhanced police uh, activity in certain areas. Let me conclude. I think I've got one minute left. So going back to the original question, could an AI predict crime before it's happening? Well, I would argue that the underpinning technologies uh, of AI, mathematics, statistics, computing, engineering, machine learning, uh, certainly could. Predictions can be made, but the question we might want to ask ourselves are, is, uh, are these predictions actually meaningful? And how do we actually validate uh, these predictions? Can these, be, these predictions actually be taken seriously by the law enforcement agencies that would want uh, these predictions? And I have to ask the question of myself, uh, can these predictions actually be taken seriously by the researchers that develop them? The technical questions, and Oliver alluded to this, of bias, of uncertainty, um, and the whole notion of our model reality mismatch um, are very serious issues and the sorts of issues that we should be concerning ourselves about. There are, of course, the ethical issues of predicting crime and probably more importantly, predicting the criminal. Right? It needs serious consideration. And the program, that, the research program that, that I mentioned, it is ambitious, but it is very circumspect. We'll be very happy if the Metropolitan Police obtains data-driven insights and actually is able to improve uh, and make more effective policing in the city. And I thought that's not a bad place to start. Thank you very much. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening. I won't immediately try to get into an argument with Mark. We could discuss this point a bit later, but I will claim that we live in an exciting time for AI. We've seen great increases in the capabilities of algorithmic systems, if you want to call them that, over the last few years that have led to their deployment widely around, uh, around many use cases that all of us use throughout the day. A lot of these improvements have, have, uh, have well, some, some of these improvements have come through uh, improvements in the actual algorithms, but a lot of the improvements have come through the greater availability of data and the great increases in the availability of computational resources. And that's interesting and important because both of those things, data and computing power, are likely to continue to increase as far as we can tell. And so even if we don't improve the systems, the, alg the algorithms, the systems will naturally continue to get better, which is noteworthy. So um, some of the systems that we, we, uh, that we see used around us in everyday life are computer vision systems. Generally, actually, we've seen great improvements in in uh, systems that are involved in tasks of perception. And some of you may know that algorithms can now recognize objects and faces in certain good situations about as well as a human can, and that's quite exciting in itself. They can even do image captioning, as shown here, and this, this, is, this isn't even a state of the art, this is from 2015, and I don't know if you can make out what it says here, but the results are, are quite impressive. At the top left, automatically the algorithm has labeled this picture as little girl is eating a piece of cake, which is not bad. Next to that, baseball player is throwing ball in game. So this is initially really quite impressive, but I would caution you from being too impressed. Um, it's very challenging to know really exactly how some of these systems are operating, and also they can sometimes go wrong in ways which can be a little bit confusing. If we look at the bottom left picture here, there's a, there's a cute baby holding a, 
uh, toothbrush, but the, 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 the label that's automat automatically generated is a young boy is holding a baseball bat. So that's not great, but you can sort of see if you squint, you can sort of see how you could imagine that looks a bit like someone holding a baseball bat. If you look at the picture at the bottom right, this was automatically labeled as a horse is standing in the middle of a road, which is a bit perplexing. Although, again, if you squint a bit, you can imagine that this type of picture is maybe the sort of scene where you might expect to see a horse. It's, it's the sort of image that this algorithm might have been trained on, this kind of background, and there are some sort of leg-like features in the middle, which you could imagine might make it go in that direction. But this shows that these algorithms can fail in worrying ways. Perhaps even more worrying are what are sometimes called adversarial examples. And these are particularly effective against deep learning that many, many of you might have heard about as a particularly popular recent form of, of machine learning, which has been very successful. So what's going on here is that a, an image classification system has been trained to be able to recognize 10,000 different classes of image. And then it's shown an image, shown on the left. It correctly identifies it as a panda, so that's good. And it has quite high confidence, it has about 58% confidence that it's a panda, which is pretty good out of 10,000 different classes. Then what happens is we take a tiny amount, 0 0.007, of this image in the middle, which to us just looks like random noise. That When we add that to the image on the left, we get the image on the right, which to us is completely uh, imperceptibly different from the image on the left. It looks exactly the same to us as the image on the left. And yet now the algorithm is 99% sure that it's a gibbon. So that doesn't sound very good. And what's happened is that this, this image in the middle is essentially the gradient. It's pushing, this, uh, it's pushing the image exactly in the direction that makes this algorithm think it's seeing a gibbon. And you could just as easily come up with a, with a similar image to make it think it, it's what any of the other 10,000 uh, different classes under consideration. So this is a bit worrying. And you might think, oh, well, maybe this is, um, this is just uh, a weird anomaly, and there must be some easy way to get around it. But actually, it's not that easy to sort this problem out. So what I'm showing here is a, um, this is a system from 2017. I'm going to show this a few times. There's a car driving along. And on, look at the right-hand image here. We're approaching a stop sign. You'll see what it shows at the bottom of that image. It's showing what the state-of-the-art uh, computer system thinks it's seeing. So you should see that it says stop, which is good. Um, and we're going along, it sees a stop sign, thinks it's stop, everything is good. Now look at the left-hand panel. And if you look closely, you'll see, as we get very close, it's got some sticky tape on it, some white and black sticky tape. Can you see that? And that tape was stuck in precise places to fool the system. And so if you look at the bottom left there, you'll see that it doesn't keep thinking that it's a stop sign. Um, it thinks it's a speed limit 45 sign, which is really, really bad. So this car just keeps going until it gets very, very close, too close to stop, and it still it keeps flipping back and forth. So this is a real challenge in real modern systems. We need to find ways to, to get around this. So what can we do to know that we can trust a system like this? So that's going to take me on to the topic of transparency and interpretability of algorithms. Complex systems can be difficult to understand. Often we need to go under the hood, as Mark mentioned before, in order to see what's really going on underneath. So we have this idea of transparency of systems. But let me suggest that transparency can actually mean quite different things to different people in different contexts. Let me give you just two examples of, of what we might mean by transparency. For the developer of a system, we often really want to understand how is our system working, so that we can know when will it work well, when will it work badly? How can we improve the system? How can we debug the system? It's one form of transparency. A quite different form of transparency would be um, to help a user understand typically one prediction or decision that an algorithm is producing. And it's going to be relevant when we, when we talk about criminal justice soon. Um, so the idea here is that we'd like, we'd like to understand exactly how did the algorithm come to the, con to the particular conclusion that it came to. And typically, we'd want to have an explanation that goes with that. Let me point out one challenge with, with explanations. When we get an explanation, as we show here, you can differentiate between the audience of the explanation and the beneficiary. So imagine that we have an online bookseller like Amazon, and many of you probably use such a system, and you get recommended products, so you might get recommended a book. And I don't know if you've noticed, uh, it used to be the case that when you were recommended a product, you could actually ask, why did you recommend this product to me? 
It's also interesting they've stopped providing this explanation. But it used to be so maybe it was recommending book A to you, and you could ask, why are you recommending book A? It would say, well, you've bought book B in the past, and you've bought book C in the past, and you liked book C, so we're recommending book A. And that sounds very sensible. But we know that actually what's really going on in their system is probably a lot more complex than that. What they're giving us is at best a kind of watered-down version of what's going on. And you should keep in mind that their, their incentive is really to give us some information which gets us to click through and buy product A. So that, that's potentially worrying. So we need to be very careful when we ask for explanations. We need to have ways to determine if the explanation is faithful. So is it really giving us an accurate representation of what's going on? And I'd say actually that's the, the idea... It, the idea of what that means is, is a little difficult to define, but it's something close to the notion of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Another reason to be concerned about this is uh, this was a classic study in psychology from the 70s. Has anyone put your hand up if you've seen this study before, this copy machine study? We've got one or two people who have seen this. It's a very interesting study. So this was back in the day when people made copies by actually going to a photocopier. The setting is you're in a library, and there's a long line of people who want to make photocopies. The experiment was that people tried to push into the line to try to make a photocopy. And there were three scenarios. So what's shown on the left here is that someone tried to push in without giving any reason for why they should be pushed in. And what happened is that 60% of the time people would let them in, but 40% of the time they wouldn't. The next setting was that someone would give a, a good reason for why they should be let in. They would say, please could you let me in because I'm in a huge hurry. And when someone said that, it might make sense, they were let in 94% of the time. But very interestingly, if people gave a fake reason, that is a reason that had zero information content, so what they would say was, please could you let me in because I need to make a photocopy. <laughs> Remarkably, still they would get 93% compliance. So the fact of saying because and giving some kind of explanation somehow magically gets people to comply. So we need to be a bit careful sometimes about asking for an explanation. And again, this emphasizes the need for having some sort of notion of faithfulness of an explanation. Let me go on to a different notion of, of uh, how, how we could trust an algorithm. I suggest that the AI systems we develop must treat all people fairly. They mustn't discriminate against any individual or minority subgroup. And this presents significant technical challenges particularly if we're going to learn from historic data which reflects past human bias, as is often the case. So this is now important in many commercial settings, such as selecting whom to interview when making a hiring decision, uh, or when making a loan. And of course, it's even more important in criminal justice. Algorithms are increasingly in use, particularly in the States, to help make decisions such as criminal sentencing or whether to release a prisoner on parole. It's very important that we treat all people fairly, and happily, we are making good progress on measuring and mitigating bias in these algorithmic systems. Actually, we're, we're making more progress there than, than we're typically managing with people, which is interesting, something to keep in mind. Further, I'd suggest that in, in a sentencing con context, we really do want transparency, as, as I mentioned before. So if an algorithm is suggesting to a judge that I should go to jail for six years, I really want to understand, well, what process did it follow? Was it was it a sensible, reasonable process? And I want to be able to challenge that if it was wrong. So that's something to keep in mind. And at a minimum, I suggest we need accountability of these systems. So we need to know that someone could be held accountable if it goes wrong. It's actually easy, even for simple systems, to discriminate if we're not careful. It can easily happen unintentionally. Okay. What's, go no What's going on here is this is a soap dispenser, a real soap dispenser, and someone with a I'm light blind. skin went and, and put their hand under and soap came out. Now someone's going to go with dark skin to the soap dispenser. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. What I do, they get... What do you have to do? That's how the this thing is. Yeah. I have so. to use that piece of white. No soap. It's a napkin? Ah, sure it is. <laughs> that so again, again. Bring your napkin again. Napkin again. Right, bring your hand again. What's your color in my hand? <laughs> Man, See, it just highlights it's actually, it's quite easy if we're not careful to have discrimination. And not just in these kinds of systems. And uh, by, it's, it's also quite easy for it to happen from people who really 
uh, are technically very sophisticated. This was a famous incident um, for using a Google image classifier a few years ago. And you can see that it accurately classifies many images, but unfortunately and terribly in the bottom in, in the bottom and the middle, you can see that people with dark skin are sometimes classified as gorillas. That's obviously a real problem, even for Google. And this is sometimes not easy to fix. So here is a, a news story from earlier this year. Three years later, the best they could do was just to remove this class of gorillas. It was actually quite challenging for them to do better than that. So in order to help tackle this, we need to get access to diverse data sets. That's going to help. And also encouraging diversity in developers among us in order to think about these issues will, 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 uh, will really uh, be a good idea. And finally, I just want to switch to a different theme that's close to what we're talking about. I want to ask this question. Is it OK to punish people for future crime? So in the story Minority Report, which some of you might have, have read, Philip K. Dick, um, he called this notion of future crime pre-crime. And if you haven't seen it, there's a good movie with, with Tom Cruise you can see about this. And of course, we don't really know if someone for sure will commit a crime in the future. As Mark suggested, all we can do is we can predict whether they're going to commit a crime. So we're really talking about if it's okay to punish people for likely crime. And just, just think for a moment. So as, um, as Gloria suggested before, I won't um, take a view on whether it's true, but let's assume, as Gloria suggested, that men are more likely to commit crime than women. <laughs> There's a view. Statistically, I'm sure that's true. It is. <laughs> if we were to punish people for likely future crime, well, it would be easy. We could just put all the men in jail. Do you think we should do that? I've got mixed views. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Can, can I just ask, who thinks, if you think that it's okay to punish people for likely future crime, please put up your hand. If you think it's not okay, please put up your hand. Interesting. One reason why people sometimes think it's not okay is, of course, we have this notion of innocent until proven guilty. And yet, we already do this. So nothing specifically to do with algorithms. We certainly do this already. So let me um, turn to uh, the Crown Prosecution site. I'm not a lawyer, but this has taken uh, direct quotes from their site. If we have uh, dangerous offenders... Um, part of our penal system, well, let me just take a, uh, back up a second. When we lock people up, generally we do it for several reasons. One is to punish them, which also provides a deterrent to, to prevent other people committing a crime or try to deter them from it. Another is potentially to rehabilitate them, which sadly doesn't often work too well. But a third reason is if we have dangerous offenders, we lock them up in order to protect the public. And that's what's being discussed here. So uh, let me just read these, uh, these sections in red. This is from a, a, Crown, a case, Crown versus Johnson, 2006. The sentence of imprisonment for public protection was concerned with future risk, future in bold. And this is um, in, from the original text in bold. And the future protection of the public, not with punishing the present offending. Or more recently, 2012, the decision made at the sentencing hearing is required to address the future. So something to keep in mind. And what we see is that, at least in our current system, it's okay for human judgments about future crime to, uh, to, to, to punish expected future crime. So perhaps the question is, what's different when an AI system is involved? Well, obviously, one important question is, can we trust it? I suggest that we need AI systems where we can certify measures of trustworthiness. We want robust systems which won't fail in brittle ways. We want fair systems which won't discriminate against people. We want transparent systems where, where that's appropriate. But we should also remember that humans are far from perfect. Humans can be somewhat arbitrary. There's evidence that if someone hasn't eaten for a long time, they start to punish people and give them longer sentences. Um, the sentence can, be, uh, can potentially depend on what they had for breakfast or whether they had an argument with their spouse. So that's, that's worrying. People can certainly be biased. And even if people give an explanation, they often tend to do that after really their gut has made the decision and they're just making a post hoc rationalization. So humans are far from perfect and maybe an AI system can do better. What do you think? Thank you.